This is going to be Genesis chapter 20. And I want to talk about the subject of how to avoid adultery. So look at Genesis 20 in verse 1. It says, And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country, and dwelled be between Kadesh and Shur, and sojourned in Gerar. Now, the first thing I want to say is, if you're gonna, going to avoid adultery, one of the things you need to do is stop seeing your wife as your sister. And that sounds a little bit funny, but a lot of husbands, it's like, after a while, they start seeing their wife as less of a girlfriend and more as a sister. Look at verse 2. It says, And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech king of Gerar sent and took Sarah. So Abraham was going around telling people that Sarah was actually his sister. Now you might not go around telling people that your wife is your sister with your mouth, but you're doing it with your actions. Uh, sometimes I've even heard husbands call their wife sister. I've heard husbands do that. They say, hey, sister, go make me a sandwich. They say, hey, sis, can you pass the salt? I mean, at best, their wife has become nothing more than a glorified roommate. If you will quit seeing your wife as your sister, then maybe she can become your girlfriend again. The thing is, Sarah really was Abraham's sister, but she was his half-sister, and they got married. If you look in Genesis 20, the chapter we're studying, and look down at verses 12 and 13, it says, Yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wonder from my father's house, that I said unto her, This is my this is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me. At every place whither we shall come, say of me, He is my brother. Now this is a strange thing, and it seems like it's a sinful thing. However, God hadn't put a rule against this until later on in the book of Leviticus. You'll see it where in Leviticus 20 and verse 17 where you couldn't take your sister to be your wife. But here in Genesis, there's no rule against Abraham taking Sarah to wife, even though she is his sister. The problem is, Abraham is going around focusing more on her being his sister than he's focusing on the fact that she is his wife. Now, when you do this, you will begin to take her for granted. If you found a good wife, then you found something good. It says in Proverbs 31.10, Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies proverbs eighteen twenty two. whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the lord ephesians five twenty five. husbands love your wives even as christ also loved the church and gave himself for it in proverbs five eighteen through 20 let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth let her be as the loving hind in pleasant roll. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times, and be thou ravished always with her love. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman, and embrace the bosom of a stranger? Most likely because you're no longer rejoicing with the wife of thy youth. You're beginning to see her as a sister. If you have a wife that's loyal, that's good to your kids and all that good stuff, then you found a good thing. See her as more than a sister in Christ. You will be less likely to commit adultery if you get back to seeing your wife as your girlfriend. See the other women as your sisters. Quit seeing your wife as your sister. See the other women as your sister. It says in 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters, with all purity. So you see that? See all the other women around you as sisters and mothers. Don't see them as a prospect. Don't see them as a potential girlfriend, a potential friend with benefits, a potential side chick. This will keep you pure and keep your affection on your wife Quit seeing your wife as your sister. See all the other women as sisters. 
Hebrews 13, 4 and 5, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Marriage is honorable in all, and in marriage the bed's undefiled. It says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, in Hebrews 13, 5, and be content with such things as ye have. Be content with the wife that you have. Be content with the wife you've got, and you'll be way less likely to avoid adultery. Now, number two, realize the consequences of adultery. What's happened in this story is Abraham has lied about Sarah. She's going around telling everyone that she is his sister, and now Abimelech has taken her. It says in Genesis 20 and verse 3, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Before the Bible was complete and before man had a written word, the Lord would speak to men in dreams and visions. And God lets Abimelech know that the consequence for adultery is death, which he already knew this in his heart. He just didn't know that he had taken a man's wife because he thought it was the man's sister. Something that will keep you from adultery is pondering about the consequences. Adultery was deadly even before the law. And God certainly makes it punishable by death under the law. As it says in Leviticus 20 and verse 10, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. There may not be a death penalty for adultery today, but you're shaving off years from your life by doing it. Romans 8.13 says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So God tells Abimelech, Behold, thou art but a dead man. He is on God's death row if he doesn't get some things straight here. It says in Genesis 20 and verse 4, but Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? You see, a nation could fall because of adultery. Notice a nation of adulterers wouldn't be considered a righteous nation. That's how God sees it. In Psalm 917, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. America is a nation full of adulterers that have forgotten God. Second Peter 2.14 says, having eyes full of adultery. And that cannot cease from sin. That's the nation we're in. A nation with eyes full of adultery. Genesis 20 and verse 7. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. And he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die. Thou and all that are thine. Notice the consequences of adultery. If you'll ponder these consequences... I think you'll be less likely to commit adultery. Notice Abimelech is still given a choice. He could have easily taken Sarah anyway. He could have had temporary pleasure that would have resulted in eternal punishment and resulted in his death and the death of his house. Abimelech was a godless man that had the law written in his heart before it was written. He knew adultery was wrong. Just like it says in Romans two fourteen and 15. It says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing them witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. You see, even though he wouldn't have had a written word, he wouldn't have had a relationship with God like Abraham, he had that law written in his heart. He knew that it was a wrong thing. To commit adultery. Now skip down in Genesis 20 and look at verses 17 and 18 to see even more consequences for adultery. It says, So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Abraham had to pray to the Lord so that he would open back up the wombs of the women in Abimelech's house. They couldn't have, have children because of this thing. That is considered a judgment from God many times. 
Not every time, but many times. You see, God has control to open and close the womb. And this shows that every time an abortionist kills a baby, that they are killing a child that the Lord allowed to be forming in the womb. Because the Lord is the one that opens and closes it. Abortion is a scary thing. Notice the right attitude, though, from the house of Abimelech. Look back up at Genesis 20 and verse 8. It says, Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning, after he had this dream from the Lord, where God said, Behold, thou art but a dead man. Abimelech rose early in the morning, and called all his servants, and told all these things in their ears. And the men were sore afraid. Notice these men did truly have the fear of the Lord, contrary to what Abraham thought when he arrived. He judged the book by his cover. He thought, these people don't have the fear of the Lord. They're going to take my wife and they're going to kill me. It says in Genesis 20, 10 and verse 11, And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou, that thou hast done this thing? And Ab Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. Abraham thought to himself, These guys will take my wife, kill me, and then shoot craps for my stuff. When you commit adultery, you at least for the moment have forgotten the fear of God. You are joining flesh with another person who God has already joined to another man. You're saying to God, I don't care that you have joined their flesh together. I'm taking this man's wife anyway. Or I don't care me and, that me and my wife have joined flesh and you've joined our flesh. I'm going to join flesh with this other woman. For that moment at least, you don't have the fear of God. And Abraham thought he was entering into a place where people wouldn't have the fear of God and these would be a place full of adulterers. So that shows that people who commit adultery, at least for that time when they're committing adultery, do not have the fear of God. Consider the consequences of adultery. And consider the character of an adulterer. Look back up at Genesis 20 and verse 5. Said he not unto me, she is my sister. This is Abimelech talking and he's talking to God and he says, Said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she even herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. So this shows that someone in adultery doesn't have integrity or innocency. You see, Abimelech was innocent. He had his integrity. He hadn't done the act. He didn't even know that Sarah was another man's wife. And you know good and well that even a lost person looks down on a man that takes another man's wife. He doesn't think that man has integrity. He doesn't think that man is innocent. The decent moral man who may be a lost man will abide by a code that you don't mess with another man's wife. And those decent moral men are few and far between today, but there are still some left. And when you know that a person has cheated on their spouse, even a lost person can't help but be a bit cautious around that person. That's just how it is. I mean, if you had a beautiful wife, would you want to leave her with King David? I wouldn't personally. In Genesis 20 and verse 5, said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. Adultery will cause people to question your integrity and make them realize you are not innocent at all. Consider the character of people who are adulterers. It ruins your character. I mean, people who go through with the act they are forsaking their morals to go through with it. I mean, it makes you very untrustworthy. I believe there are people who have messed up and would never commit the act again. But you have to consider that most people won't give you the benefit of the, benefit of the doubt. They, they have a saying that says, once a cheater, always a cheater. I mean, it isn't far-fetched to say if she will cheat with you, then she will cheat against you. And if she doesn't have enough respect for your wife to turn you down, that she isn't going to have enough respect for you to turn another man down later on down the road when she marries you. Abraham shows what he thought of an adulterer. As I talked about before, Abraham thought Abimelech and his people didn't have the fear of God and would forcibly take his wife. 
in Genesis 20 and verse 11, And Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. This shows an adulterer does not have the fear of God. You need to keep the fear of God. Next, if you're going to avoid adultery, you need to ask God for protection. Maybe you are constantly faced with this temptation of adultery. This is one of those cases where being ugly would be a blessing. In all seriousness, that may sound like I'm trying to be funny, but the uglier you are, the less temptation for adultery many times. Not all the time, but many times. I mean, I understand that some people can't even go to work or to Walmart or to the post office without somebody hitting on them. I imagine their temptation is pretty high, but since they're a good-looking person, they got all these people flirting with them. By the grace of God, I don't have that problem. Hopefully you don't either. Sometimes being not so handsome is a blessing. What you need to do is pray to God for protection against this sin. Uh, why get all dressed up and all prettied up to go to work so the other men can look at you and then when you're around your husband, you just don't even care? Or the other way around. Uh, men will make sure the breath smells good at work around the woman they're attracted to and then their breath smells like death to their wife when they get home you see don't make yourself look all good around people that are going to hit on you and then come home and not even care what you look like to your spouse that makes no sense you're just asking for trouble and genesis 20 and verse 6 and god said unto him in a dream yea i know that thou didst this in the integrity of the heart for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Notice God kept Abimelech from it. In the sense he's warning him in a dream before it happens. Pray the Lord to lead you out of temptation. Ask God for protection. Pray that he'll lead you out of any temptation to commit adultery. In Matthew 6, 13, it says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Luke twenty two forty. 40, And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. You see, there's always a way to escape temptation, but pray the Lord can make it more clear. Maybe he could put up more exit signs and maps to really lead you towards that escape. Sometimes the best way to get out of the temptation is to get out of that person's life entirely and to get them out of your life. If they are, for whatever reason, living under your roof, it would be a good idea to get them out of there. Abimelech was going to get Sarah out of his house. It says in Genesis 20, 7 through 8, Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning, and called all his servants, and told all these things in their ears, and the men were sore afraid. Abimelech took action after that dream. It lit the fear of God under him. And maybe you work side by side with somebody like this. Somebody that flirts with you all day. You need to fix the problem now. You can start witnessing to them. Bring your Bible to work. Talk good to them about your spouse. Talk about the Lord. These things can put a damper on adultery. I mean, who wants to commit adultery with somebody who's always talking good about their spouse and talking about the Lord? Start talking about the stuff in the book of Revelation, and then they'll just think you're crazy anyway. Start talking about those locusts coming up out of the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 9. They're going to think you're some kind of crazy conspiracy theorist just for being, you know, a Bible believer. They're going to be like, I, I, I want to get away from this person. You know, if it's possible, I'd consider asking the supervisor to be moved to another spot in the plant or just get another job. I mean, what's worse, changing jobs or cheating on your wife, possibly? You know, pray the Lord will get you out of the situation. Ask God for protection. And next thing, if you want to avoid adultery, see adultery how God sees it. 
In Genesis 20 and verse 9, Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee? That thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin. Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. So Abimelech confronts Abraham. He's angry. I mean, he's got every right to be. One of the worst things in the Christian life is getting rebuked by a lost person. And that's what's happening. Notice that Abimelech calls this a great sin. He says, Abraham has brought on me this great sin. See adultery as God see it, sees it. It's a great sin. In John 19, 11, Jesus talks about a greater sin. Some sins are obviously worse than others. Obviously, the Committing the act of adultery physically is worse than thinking adulterous thoughts. I mean, you need to see adultery as God sees it. He sees it as a great sin. We're living in a time where adultery is glamorized. You see it on the movies, on the TV shows, and in the music. It starts to be less dirty in your eyes after a while. In Genesis twenty ten through 11, And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. The next thing is, don't live a lie. If you want to avoid adultery, don't live a lie. In Genesis twenty twelve through 13, it says, And yet, indeed, she is my sister, she is the daughter of my father, and not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And it came to pass, when God caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said unto her, This is thy kindness, which thou shalt show unto me at every place, whither we shall come. Say of me, He is my brother. Notice that it, this is a half-truth. Sarah was his sister. But he left out the part about her being his wife. A half-truth is still a lie. And many people who live in adultery are also living a lie. They may not say they are single when they go to work or out to town. But they don't show any signs of being married. They take their ring off. They don't have any pictures of their spouse. If you're married, I think it's a good thing to have your wife as your wallpaper on your phone, on your laptop. Have a picture of her on your office desk if you work in an office. If you have Facebook, then put a picture of you and your family together as your profile picture. I mean, don't get on social media and pooch out your lips and show cleavage in your profile picture. All that is saying to the other men is, I'm open for business. Uh, don't change back to your maiden name on social media every time you get in a fight with your husband. I know a lot of people at work who come in and the only time they talk about their spouse is to complain and down the, their spouse and tell everyone how sorry their spouse is. So they flirt with each other. And I completely understand that we're living in a time when women have to work sometimes. Because of the lack of character though and faith, lack of faithfulness in people, the factories can be breeding grounds for adultery. You have men and women working side by side, and the man is a pervert who's been watching too much porn. And most men are slobs, and they don't care about anyone but themselves. While the women come in, and they dress like hoes, and they ag, they ag it on. They may not flirt first, but they will giggle and smile every time he hits on her. And they're at home, they're married to their glorified roommate at best, and then when they go, go to work, they live a lie. Adultery almost happened here in Genesis 20 because Abraham and Sarah lived a lie. Now the next thing, don't become a threat to others. In Genesis 20, 14 through 15, Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah, his wife. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. Out of the fear of God, Abimelech restores Sarah back to Abraham and gives him sheep, oxen, and servants. He even said to live anywhere in the land he wants to. Abimelech was showing that he wanted no part with Abraham's wife. He was showing that he was no threat any longer to their marriage. Maybe you aren't married, but you can help other marriages by not being a threat to their marriage. Abimelech took the threat of himself away from Abraham's marriage. And you need to quit being a threat to another person's marriage. Quit trying to flirt with another man's wife. Some ways you can abstain from being a threat to other people's marriage is quit flirting with married women. The women should quit dressing like a prostitute. Men should put a shirt on, 
How is it modest for a man to go around with his shirt off? A lot of people say, well, you shouldn't be looking at other people. What are people supposed to do, blindfold themselves or something? You don't have to go around showing everybody your nakedness. Uh, quit trying to show up a man or woman in front of their spouse. I mean, that's wicked. All that stuff is subtly trying to steal someone away. Quit trying to get alone with someone else's husband or wife. If a married person flirts with you, then you should stay away from them, brag on their spouse, talk about the Lord and the Bible, take a different route to the time clock or whatever you got to do other than entertain the flirting. A lot of people don't flirt, but they sure do entertain it. And there are very few reasons why you should have another man's or woman's number or Snapchat. You see, a lot of these people are doing these Snapchats where after you send the picture or the message, it disappears and then your wife or husband can't see that hussy sexting you on there. You know, God sees all that stuff. And quit liking and putting catcall comments on another man's wife's pictures. Just because she's letting it all hang out on Facebook, it uh, doesn't mean you have to ag it on. Let that picture go with no likes. I mean, her husband is too sorry to ever tell her she looks good, so she's going on there and seeing how many likes and perverted comments she can get. You know, I could keep going on and on, but you know good and well, when you are being a threat to another person, you know you're being a threat. Treat others like you want to be treated. Do you want all these other women dressed in a way to cause your husband to look at them? Absolutely not. So you shouldn't dress in a way to make their husbands look. Treat them how you want to be treated. Many times you hear a woman say, I don't care if my husband looks as long as he doesn't touch. Deep down, she doesn't want him looking at other women, but she says that to make herself feel better. Men are bad at constantly looking at other women they aren't married to. And if they see a woman they think looks good, they might even make a comment about her in front of their wife. That's how stupid they are. There are men with posters of half-naked women in their man cave and their wife has to see it every time she goes in there to clean his dirty laundry. He's just sorry. The saying, look but don't touch, is completely stupid. The next point is, don't look or touch. Yes, don't look or touch. Look up at Genesis 20 and verse 16. It says, And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother... A thousand pieces of silver. This is Abimelech talking to Sarah. He's like, I've given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Notice he calls her his brother. I think he's probably being a little bit sarcastic here after what he's just went through. He's like, yeah, you know, your brother, which is actually your husband, you know, I've given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other. Thus she was reproved. So he just reproved her here. He, you know, kind of got onto her a little bit here because, I mean, she went along with the lie. But he says, he is to thee a covering of the eyes. The fact that a woman is married should be a covering of the eyes to other men. And I know that's not the case most times, but that's the way it should be. If you know a woman is married, just the fact that she's married should be a covering of the eyes to you. Mix that with her dressing modestly. And adultery would be a lot less likely. If you're going to be a covering of the eyes for your wife, then you need to be around as much as possible. And I know in some cases that isn't possible. At work, uh, the men have a joke that they don't want to work third shift because if they work third shift too much, Jody will be knocking. And Jody is some fictional character, I guess, that comes around their wife when they're not around and that's true a lot of times you know you stay at work too much when you don't really have to you know that could become a problem and I know in some cases you can't help that but I believe a man also needs to be jealous I believe a man should be jealous over his wife if a man is flirting with your wife then you need to confront him about it don't think it's funny don't ag it on I mean, why would you do that anyway? But it says in Matthew 5, 28, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, obviously, committing adultery with her in your heart's not as bad as going through with the act. But, but committing it in your heart leads to the act. You need to be a covering of the eyes for your wife. 
because most men today in Second Peter 2.14 are having eyes full of adultery and they can't cease from sin. Men have eyes full of adultery and the women are giving them an eye full. They call it eye candy. You see, things like TikTok, all that is is a free strip club for a man where they can just scroll through that trash forever. I've seen old married men looking at TikTok at work, having eyes full of adultery, just sitting there scrolling. Why are you scrolling for hours looking at women who wouldn't give you the time of day anyway? You shouldn't look or touch. You say, well, I'm just looking. I don't actually get with other women. Well, you shouldn't look or touch. It says in Genesis 20 and verse 4, all the way up back in Genesis 20 and verse 4, it says, But Abimelech had not come near her. Talking about Sarah. Abimelech never touched Sarah. He had never come near her. And they say, if you never take the first drink, then you won't become an alcoholic. Here's another tip. Never touch another woman, and you can't ever commit the physical act of adultery. Don't touch her hand or anything. Just only touch your wife. In Genesis 20 and verse 6, it says, And God said unto him in a dream, talking about Abimelech, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Don't look or touch. God caused him not to touch Sarah. He didn't want him to look or touch. And, you know, I'll have some smart aleck say, well, how am I supposed to go through life without ever looking at women? Because, I mean, I work with women. I see them every day. Well, I'm meaning don't look as in look, look. Obviously, you're going to see women when you're walking down the road, when you're driving, when you're out in public. I'm talking about don't look. Don't give it a double take. Just have your eyes looking straight before you, if you can. It says in 1 Corinthians 7, 1, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. You know, you don't, you don't need to be touching another man's wife. Now the last thing I'll say, there is forgiveness, there's victory, and there's healing through the Lord. In Genesis 20, 17 through 18, it says, So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. The Lord had closed the wombs. The Lord had closed the wombs of the house of Abimelech. Abraham prayed, and the Lord opened them again. So there is forgiveness, and it seems everyone was forgiven in the story. Abraham's prayers are heard, and Abimelech's house is healed. Maybe you've already committed adultery. Just confess your sin and forsake it, and then keep going for the Lord.